morning, everybody. It is good to be back with you this week, I think. Um, no, it is a blessing to be back with you. I understand that when I'm gone, we pack the place out, so um, I think I just need to go away more often. And um, I appreciate you allowing me to be gone last week and appreciate... Now, of course, Nathan brings half the audience with him when he comes. I understand that. But I understood we had a really good crowd and we had some guests with us last week, and so I'm very grateful for that. Um, it's been an interesting week in so many ways, and there were seven of us that got together on Tuesday. I think there were seven of us that got together on Tuesday, and we continued our um, revitalization of things. In other words, we threw out a whole bunch of stuff we don't need anymore that's just been piled up. And if you walk down the hallway and stare in some rooms, you'll find a door that's open that's been closed for the last couple of years because you can get in that room. Um, Jan got a nice surprise in the office this morning. She's like, we can actually have a party in here now. And if you look at the storage room in the back where we had all kinds of stuff and you couldn't get in the door, you can actually walk in the door. And there's all kinds of shelves in there that can be filled up over the next 10 years so somebody else can come throw it all out 10 years from now. Um, but I appreciate everybody who came and helped on Tuesday to make that possible and just in a process of revitalizing um, what we're doing here at the facility and, and, and redefining some rooms and making a building that's available for use in its fullness and I'm excited about that. I, I told a couple people I feel like that's phase one. I said phase two is that shed out there and phase three is the painting and the redoing of some of these rooms um, to make them ready for even more ministry in the future but I'm um, very very excited about that. We obviously are aware of all that happened this week in our community um, with everything that Carolyn's been through, we were talking about. It was really interesting. I shared with her this morning. I even had, I was out driving a little bit yesterday, and I picked up one couple from the airport, and they were coming in for a funeral and stuff, and we were talking about all the devastation, and the one lady got out of the car, and she said, here, give this to the lady in your church, and gave me something that I shared with Carolyn this morning. She said, I don't have much, but I guess got to do something. And then I picked up another guy who works at a local French bakery, and um, we were talking about it, and he said, I said, yeah, we know somebody in the church. And um, he said, well, here, I got something for her and gave it. And so I laid it on the front seat so it didn't go in my pocket. And I actually passed it on this morning, so that was great. And then another just great instance, I've got a dear friend of mine who she actually played volleyball for me, and her and her husband owned a, owned a roofing company. And, but they've been out in the community just helping people. And, um, and, and I can tell you if, you, if you need anything or know of people that need help, these are good people. You let me know, and I'll get them connected with them. But they've just said, we're going to go help the community, and that's what we're going to do first and foremost. And that's been really neat to see. And so it is interesting how God works in all of these things. Well, it is a joy we come together. We're going to continue. As you noticed this morning, there were some interesting technical difficulties and some difficulties with the getting the right stuff on the screen and difficulties with getting it downloaded and internet and fortunately we still have internet here but there are people without and one guy in one neighborhood was posting that day, anybody having trouble with the internet and I was like somebody posted back and went well some people are having trouble with not having a place to live right now Are you still worried about your internet and he kind of said whoops sorry didn't think through that one and um, but we're going to continue our series in John today, but I'm going to take a little different approach to it. Um, we've worked through most of the first four chapters under the series that I've entitled Believe. We're actually going to finish that fourth chapter right after, um, right after Easter next Sunday, and then after that we're going to go into to a new series to continue on in the Gospel of John for a little while longer. We're not going to complete the whole Gospel this year. I hope to make it a two-year thing, and we'll finish the rest of it, because we've got to get back to Acts this summer and finish that up also. But this week, we're going to jump ahead a little bit in the Gospel of John, and I'm going to do something just a little bit different, because sometimes I think we need to hear less from the person and more from the Scripture. And so we're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of Scripture this morning. And it's all based in this, and this is kind of where we base this whole thing to begin with. But John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31, while we're not going to study this passage today, this is our foundational Scripture. For today, and I hope you'll see why. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. 
So he said to them, unless I see his, in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them and Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Lord, we come today and we're going to look at this incredible week that takes us from a triumphal entry to crucifixion. And we understand that the words that John has laid down to us are words that are there so that we may believe. And so, Lord, may we find truth in them as we study your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. We could easily go back to this passage that I just read from, from the Gospel of John and, 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 and this interaction between Thomas and Jesus, and we could spend a lot of time there, and at some point we are going to, and there are interesting things that jump out. Thomas says, if I don't see it, if I don't feel it, if I don't touch it, I'm not going to believe it. And then it tells us that it was eight days later before Jesus came and appeared to him. There's this whole waiting period where Jesus is going, all right, you don't believe, don't believe, don't believe, don't believe, don't believe. And Thomas is going through this and his doubts grow and grow and then boom, Jesus appears. And Thomas touches and says, my Lord and my God. And John tells us that I've written everything down in this book. All these stories it doesn't cover everything Jesus did, but I wrote it down for two reasons. Number one, that you may believe. And number two, that you may have life. And those two things go together. And we've talked over and over in this series as we've been through it since the 1st of January about how believing is more than just knowing something. It is giving ourselves over and fully and completely to something. And so we come to a point in the gospel. John's gospel is really, really a unique gospel. It's the one gospel that doesn't give us a whole lot about the Lord's Supper. It really doesn't. We're, we're going to spend time here at the end of, of the service today taking partaking of communion as a family, as is, is our as is our custom to do, but God, John's gospel doesn't really dwell in that. But John has these first 11 chapters where he's talking about Jesus' life and the ministry and things he does. And John's gospel is how many chapters? 20, 21 chapters. And, and the last half of John's gospel all deals with the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Isn't that something? He spends half of it. In fact, chapter 12 and we're going to work when we come back after Easter all the way through chapter 11. And then we're going to pick up in chapter 12 next year. But unless the Lord comes before then, which I'm quite okay with, if he would like to come on and take us all out of here, that would be great. But chapter 12 starts with, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, had, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. And from chapter 12 on, it goes through that last week, week and a half of Jesus' life. In fact, we get a little further down in chapter 12, and it tells us he came six weeks before, so now we've got five days before the Passover. In verse 12 of chapter 12, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And I love this next verse. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. 
It's really interesting. It's telling us just before this feast, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and each of the Gospels gives this to us a little bit differently. But they tell us about how Jesus comes into Jerusalem, fulfilling Scripture, sitting on a donkey's colt, on the foal of a donkey coming in. And, and this is Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday we celebrate with Hosannas, and Jesus is coming in, and, and, and here comes the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And, and as we've grown up, many of us in churches, we've grown up, and then on that Sunday morning, we come in and we get our palm branches and we wave them and we sing some of you are like yeah I remember doing that every year when I was growing up and waving the palm branches and singing Hosanna and then you always get these great sermons about how it's a, a so far from the praises and cheers to the jeers and curses that come just a few days later and what I want to do today is not dwell so much on Palm Sunday but I want to look at five scenes that happen between Palm Sunday and the crucifixion that's coming there are some really interesting things. And, and, um, and John's gospel, from here until the point of the crucifixion, is just story after story about what's happening, and it's sharing the words of Jesus. But there are five scenes that we can find in the gospel, from the triumphal entry to the crucifixion, that I want us to look at and actually hear the words and see the words as the gospel writer put out to us. You're going to see them in John 12. We're going to talk about Jesus' prediction of his death again. When we look through the gospel of Mark and when we look through Luke, Jesus over and over predicted, I am going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going to be lifted up. And so we're going to look at those. But we're going to see an act of service by Jesus. We're going to see an act of prayer by Jesus. We're going to see an act of betrayal by humans. And we're going to see a total act of rejection. And I think it speaks to this relationship that we have with Jesus. It speaks to what Thomas had and this doubt and I don't understand. And we're going to see in this week that there are those of us, Jesus is going to set the example for everything. And there are those of us who are going to betray him. There are those of us who are going to reject him. And, and this message may not end on the highest of notes because the high note comes next Sunday. A high note comes next Sunday, but this is some truth. So let's look at, first of all, John 12, verses 27 through 36. And, and, and as always, I like to point out that there are truths in these. And the first truth that we find in this prediction that Jesus gives is that Jesus knows all. Jesus knows everything that is coming. It reads as follows. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered, and others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus had answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. And the people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is gone, going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Here we have the first of these, these little incidences that, that happened during this week. And Jesus is, is talking. And, 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 and prior to this, he said little things like, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus is setting a foundation in his teaching to his disciples that, guess what? For this to really be what it's supposed to be, there must be death. There must be death because out of death is going to come life. And he sits there and he, he's going, my soul's troubled. The humanity of Christ is sitting there going, this is hard. This is hard. As a human, do I want to say, take this away from me? And, and later he's going to be praying in the garden, if, if it be your will, take this cup away from me, but not my will thine. Here he's going, should I just say, hey, I don't want to do this? Father, take, and then he says, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this because this is all about glorifying the name of God the Father. And a voice came from heaven and says, I've both glorified it and I'm going to do it again. And the people hear this voice and some think it's thundered and others are thinking an angel has spoken to them. And Jesus says, you didn't hear the voice because of me, you heard it for your sake. 
so that you would understand because judgment is coming to this world. This is the moment, this is the place when all the sins of all times and everything is going to be judged in one moment, in one place. But the one who rules this world is going to lose this battle, is what he says right here. And he says, and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. He's just talked about how there must be death and now there must be life. And the people say, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. So how can you die if the Messiah is going to be here forever and Jesus going, guess what? It's not permanent. I'm going to go through it. I'm going to take on the sins of the world. I'm going to suffer it all. And when it's all said and done, I am going to be the Messiah forever. And he goes on and he says, listen, I'm here with you right now. I'm here with you right now, so walk while you have it. If you walk in darkness, so you don't, you don't know where you're going, but while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. And guess what? He says, I'm going to come back from the dead. He says in another place in Scripture, I'm going to come back from the dead. I'm going to conquer death, hell, and the grave, and the Son is going to be with you. And while you have the chance, walk in the light. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen in the week and a half ahead. He knew that the cross was in front of him, but he also knew that the grave and the empty tomb was in front of him. And that's how Jesus kicks off this whole week with this teaching about walk in the light, become a son become a follower, become one who knows me. Now Jesus goes on after he says all this, and Jesus says, you know what? Not only is it going to be about what I know, I'm going to show you how to serve one another. In John 13, 1 through 17, we're going to see this great, this great passage of, of, of service that Jesus lays out. We find this truth that Jesus serves everyone. King of kings, Lord of lords, one that's going to conquer death, hell, and the grave is going to be a servant. Paul writes about it in Philippians. Talks about how Jesus, in being in very nature get God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but took on the form of a servant. And we have this great little story right here that's really interesting. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Isn't that a cool line? He loved them to the end. Jesus never stopped loving those who were with him and never will. And supper being ended, the dev devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which we can get into that another time and who he is and where he's come from, to betray him. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Isn't that interesting? Jesus, knowing that he had everything and where he was going and what he was doing and had all majesty and glory, what did he do? He put all of his stuff aside, took up a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And this is really interesting vision and, and, and there's a lot about to go into at some point about what it really meant to wash somebody's feet. When guests would come into your home, when you would do things, when you're inviting them in, you're included. If you, if you haven't seen the movie Jesus Revolution, I, I recommend that. But there's a scene in there where as people are coming in the door, they're washing their feet. When the pastor says, you know what, I've got to be just like Jesus. And these people that are nothing like me, I don't understand where they come from, how they are, who they are. I'm going to wash their feet. And he does, each and every one that comes in. And he took it straight from the gospel. And he came to Simon Peter. Now you got to understand, Jesus and Peter had an interesting relationship. Over and over again, good stuff, bad stuff. Peter was, was stubborn and bullheaded, and he was brash and brave, and he was all kinds of things. And he comes to him and he said, Lord, are you washing my feet? Because Jesus is the, Peter's the one that said to him, you're the rock, or excuse me, you're the Messiah. You're the Messiah, you're the one. And Jesus said to him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And remember what we just read earlier in John's Gospel? The disciples did not understand these things as they were happening, but afterwards it all made sense to them. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. And this is not Peter being rebellious, this is Peter going, I know who you are. You're greater than me. You're more than me. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Jesus says, no, you've got to be just as humble as anybody else. And Peter said, okay, 
do my hands and my head too, get all of me. And Jesus said to him, if you're already bathed, if you're already here, you need only to wash your feet, but it's completely clean. And you're clean, but not all of you. But he also says to Peter, I'm going to bathe part of you, but you're not totally clean yet. Let me tell you something, Peter. He knew he would betray him. And therefore he said, you are not all clean. And this goes back to the first point. Jesus knows everything. But Jesus as the servant knew where Peter was going and what was coming, and yet he washed his feet anyway because he wanted to include him. And it's going to make such a difference for Peter. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you know these things, what things? That you must serve one another. And Jesus is going to the cross. He knows what's coming. And he says, what's one of the most important things I can leave to those who follow me? I need to teach them they must serve one another. Because that's what true love really is. And we find it in these days. And we're going to experience it in the weeks ahead as things around here rebuild and stuff. And there are going to be people who are going to live this out. And they're going to serve and do stuff. And there's going to be other people who are not. Let's not be unrealistic. There will be people who come in and try to take advantage of situations and people and stuff, and that's just reality. But Jesus says, if you're a follower of mine, if you know who I am, if you understand who I am, if you know these things, then you must serve one another in the weeks and days and months ahead. So the second part of it is Jesus serves all, and the corollary to that is because Jesus served everybody, so, uh, so must we. Here's the third thing Jesus did. Jesus prayed for his disciples. Jesus prays for everyone as we're about to see in this passage. But as you go through, and we're skipping some incredible stuff in John 14 and 15, and we've got these things about this mansion that's being prepared and this place that's being prepared for us and all these things, but we're going over because Jesus is setting examples of what to do. And in John 17, he prays this incredible prayer. In fact, John 17 starts with, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. You have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Jesus says, Father, I've come into this place. The time has come. The gift of eternal life is here. And then he comes to this in these verses and he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. He says, I've taken everything that we are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these that you have given to me, these that have traveled with me, these have gone everywhere, I have shown them, I have manifested, I have made real to them. It's not just told them. I have made real to them everything. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have surely known that I come forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. He says, I've gathered these around me. We know of the twelve and everybody else who travels with him, and he includes them all in it. And he says, I've got them all, and they are believers because of what we have done here and amongst them. And then he says this, I pray for them. And I, I do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And this is a whole, we can get into whole how this deals with the Trinity and Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But what it's saying is, Lord, I'm praying for these that are right here with me right now because of what's about to happen here. Now, I am no longer in the world. But these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Isn't this interesting? He's not done yet. He hasn't gone to the cross. He hasn't gone, but he said, it's finished. It's done. The work is taken care of. It's already here. And, and I'm moving on to the next step to do what's next. And these guys are still going to be here. 
Lord, hold on to them. Let's guide them. Let's give them the strength they need. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. And we talked about the son of perdition. It's talking about Judas Iscariot right here, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Lord, I'm praying for them that even when I'm not here among them, they're going to have joy in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And he lays out something that's really important for us. Just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean the whole world's going to accept it and like it. We see more and more. We had hate crimes directed specifically at Christians in the last week. And it's not going to get better. If you've read the scriptures, if you've paid attention to Ezekiel, to Daniel, to Revelation, to all the things we say, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse before it finally, ultimately gets really good. And that's the day we're waiting for. And that's the day that's coming. He says, but I've given, them, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. They are different. They are set apart. They have some promise that goes beyond this world. I do not pray that you should take them. And Jesus says, I don't want you to take them out of the world. I don't want you to take them out of the trials, the tribulations, and the troubles that are coming ahead, but that you should keep them from the evil one. No matter what they go through, do not let Satan overcome them. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So make them holy by your truth. That's what sanctify means. Your word is truth. So how do you become sanctified? How do you become holy? How do you become sanctified? Through the word, through the truth. And as you sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. He says, I'm not even taking them out, I'm sending them in. They're going to go in, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may be sanctified. And he goes on, this prayer is incredible. I do not pray for these alone, but for also those who will believe in me through their word. He said, I'm praying for them. I've gathered them up, but now I'm going to send them out into the world. Don't take them out. Let them go do the task that they're there so that others may believe that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world, O righteous Father. The world has not known you, but I have known you and these have known that you sent me and I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love which with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. It's an incredible prayer, and yet it encompasses all of the gospel in this one prayer. Jesus prays for people, and he says, I want them, Lord, to know me and to know my love. I want them to to persevere in the world in which they are. I want them to go out in the world to tell others. I want them to bring others into the family, and when they bring others into the family, we're all together united as one. And that's the whole gospel. And Jesus prays that for him. And it's incredible. And then as you go on, though, Jesus has done this. He knows everything. He knows what's coming. He's prayed for people. And in John 18, 15 through 26, we see betrayal. And sometimes when we think of the word betrayal, we automatically think of Judas. That's who we think of. This betrayal isn't Judas. This is the one that Jesus said when he washed his feet, you are not totally clean yet. And this is one who loves him, who cares about him. And yet sometimes we betray him. And Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. And this is a great thing about the Gospel of John. Every now and then you'll see this, the disciple whom Jesus loved, another disciple. And scholars are are unanimous in thinking that John is referring to himself in these situations. You're going, to see, you're going to see this again after the resurrection when Jesus and Peter are walking on a beach and they turn around and say, what's going to happen to this other disciple, the one whom you loved? And John, they're talking about John. And John and Peter are following him. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the priest. So John's going, I, I actually went into the court. The high priest knew me. I went in. I had some connections. But Peter stood at the door outside. So Peter doesn't get into the courtyard. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door, and then Peter got in. It's like these pictures you see of these you know, really ex- fancy clubs and nightlife that people go to, and everybody's standing in line and like, okay, you can go in. Yeah, but I know him. Oh, okay, well, he can go in too. 
you know, and it's who you know and how you get in. And John makes it possible for Peter to get in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And Peter said, I am not. He wanted to make sure he got in the door. I'm not. Now the servants and the officers who made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So here we got another thing. Once you get in the courtyard, there's a fire in there. It's cold outside. You're not getting in. It comes in. There's a fire. Peter's like, I need to get warm. I'm going to go to the fire. So I'm going to stand around here with the other people. While that's happening, the high priest asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered, and I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. The high priest is asking Jesus questions. Jesus says, I got no secrets. I've been right out here. Ask everybody I've ever talked to. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him and said, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Great sermon for another time right there. Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter, while all this is going on, stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? And Simon's like, Hey, this fire is really good. I'm warm. And he's denied and said, I am not one of his disciples. I'm just a guy here getting warm. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter had cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. There's a truth here that's hard sometimes. It says, no matter how well we know Jesus, no matter how closely we have followed him, we're just one warm fire away from denying everything. And it's a dangerous place to be. And it's a hard place to be. And the reality is, for many of us, at some point in our life, we just may just back away from it. Now, the aftermath of this story is great. We'll see it in John chapter 21 at some point where, where Jesus is going to ask him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And he's going to erase all of this because Jesus' forgiveness is, is greater than anything. But the reality is that there's always a chance that we're going to betray Jesus when it comes to being warm and at the fire, when it comes to being comfortable, when it comes to being accepting what this world has to offer us. We may forget. And so John writes this story to remind us never ever forget who we follow because sometimes we just flat out reject him sometimes we just flat out reject Jesus John chapter 19 starts like this it says Pilate took Jesus and scourged him and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns put it on his head they put on him a purple robe they said hail the king of the Jews and they struck him with their hands Pilate went out again and he said in verse 4 Pilate goes out again and said to them Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. We are at the Passover. We are at this feast. We are at this celebration of unleavened bread. We're celebrating the fact that, that God led the people of Israel out of their captivity in Egypt. We're celebrating all these things. We're celebrating that the angel of death has passed over. And now we have God himself in human form manifested among us. And he's standing there and he's being held captive. And Pilate... Pilate goes out and says, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. We're hard on Pilate as we should be over the years for things that are there, but I think, I think we've got to point this out. Pilate got it. There's no fault in him. And yet Pilate's still not going to follow. We may know that Jesus is a great man and a great teacher, we can confess it with our mouths, but if it's not a follow, it doesn't make any difference at all. And Pilate says, I know it, but I'm going to go with whatever the crowd says. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold your king, behold the man. Therefore the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate looked at him and said, You take him and crucify him, I find no fault in him. 
This is where Pilate's going to wash his hands of the whole things. But the problem is, Pilate, you have power over all of this. You're just as guilty. You can want to wash your hands, but your, your hands are not clean. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Isn't there great truth in that? Isn't there great truth in that? Because he did exactly what he said he was going to do. And he took on human form and human flesh. And they got it right. They just didn't realize they had it right. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? I love this line. Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friends. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate, therefore, heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. The chief priest has made the confession that he himself made himself to be the son of God. We're going to worship what this world has instead. We're going to go with what this world has. We're going to reject the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we're going to take this world. Our king is going to be Caesar. Our king is going to be whatever this, the money of this world, the fame of this world, the fortune of this world. We're going to do that. And he delivered them, him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. Pilate knew the truth. He was not guilty and yet he gave in anyhow to the world. The chief priests, whether they knew it or not, confessed the truth. And yet they gave in to this world. And they betrayed Jesus. So I share these with you because sometimes in the week of Easter what we do is we talk about the triumphal entry on Sunday. We talk about the resurrection the next Sunday and we miss some of the stuff that happens in between and some of the stuff that happens in between is incredible. It's incredible. And these stories are here and we just needed to hear the scripture and they remind us that Jesus knows all. Jesus knows everything. Jesus serves everyone and calls us to do the same. Jesus prays for all of us. He loves us so deeply and he is with us through every step of this world and even because of that, sometimes we betray him and sometimes we reject him. It's hard. But it's truth. And John laid it all out for us. And so we come today to close this service with a time where we're reminded that on that evening, uh, uh, just before the whole Passover, Jesus met with his disciples and he shared this great meal with them. And at the end of the meal, then, he did something very, very special and unique. And he took these elements of the Passover. And we're going to take these elements here this morning. And, and he just simply said, I'm going to give to you my body and my blood. And he's laid out this whole week going, this is what's coming. This is what's coming. The Son of Man is going to be lifted up. And when he is lifted up, it's going to make all the difference for those who believe in him and those who follow him. And it's going to be a life eternal. And so we're going to close this morning simply by, by taking these elements of communion and fellowshipping together and understanding that what Jesus did was for all of us, that he prayed for all of us, and that he calls all of us to follow him wherever he may lead. Lord, we come today to this to this time of communion, this time of the Lord's Supper, and we are reminded that in that last week to ten days from the time you went to Bethany on, you left great examples of who we should be. You reminded us of our own failings, and yet ultimately you went to the cross and were resurrected. And so, Lord, we come here together today, and we partake of this as a family, and we thank you for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask... Mike and, and John, if you'll come and distribute. We'll do as we've been doing.